So the North Carolina Japan Center is extremely honored today uh, to be interviewing Dr. David Ambaras. Uh, he is one of our, the members of our uh, academic advisory committee and a longtime friend of the center. Uh, his book, uh, Japan's Imperial Underworlds, Intimate Encounters at the Borders of Empire, is an extremely fascinating book, and we're very lucky to be interviewing him today. David, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to first ask you about what was it that led to this, this drive and desire to research this specific area that I, and also, could you give us just an, an overview of the book and, and what you, uh, you talk about in it? Sure. Um, so Japan's Imperial Underworlds, and I'll show a cover of, of the cover here. Um, Japan's Imperial Underworlds, Intimate Encounters at the Borders of Empire is, um, a book about Japan's relationship with China in the late 19th and early 20th century, roughly from the 1870s uh, to the 1930s. And then my epilogue carries the story up into um, the present. And um, it's a book that doesn't look at um, China-Japan relations through a traditional lens of diplomatic history or military history or, or political history. Um, or intellectual history, really, but it looks at how um, Japanese and Chinese people at the, at the margins of their societies have interacted through migration uh, and um, how the movement of these marginal peoples and the kinds of um, uh, lives that they, they forged um, were, were understood uh, largely negatively by um, Japanese public opinion and by Japanese government um, officials, but also sensationalized in ways that um, serve the purposes of Japanese nationalism and imperialism. So it's a book about Japanese imperialism in its relationship with China. Um, it's a book that's very influenced by geographical thinking, geographical theory, and so I'm trying to um, get beyond a notion of Japan as an enclosed, self-contained territorial state with a society that is boxed in by that territorial um, demarcation uh, and China similarly uh, and to think about how borders work in the modern world to think about how the Japanese state as it was modernizing and becoming an empire was trying to establish very secure borders um, around itself um, materially and ideologically, and how the movement of people from China to Japan or from Japan to China, these very marginal people that I'll talk a bit about um, in a second, um, threaten that project. And so um, that's the, the basic framing and, and the, the larger um, takeaway, or one of the larger takeaways is that um, we've long had this um, narrative of um, Japan rising from the Meiji Restoration forward and China falling from the Opium Wars onward in the 19th century. Um, and that the late 19th century is when these two trajectories cross. Japan becomes the rising power in the Far East and China becomes the, the sick man of, of, a of East Asia, basically. Um, and what my study tries to do is to say that, well, you know, if you think about it in terms of flows of trade and of, of people and um, of human relationships, it's, it's not that clean cut a story. That in fact, um, even as Japan was trying to claim centrality in East Asia and displace China as the leading power, there was always this fear um, that China was stronger, that China would, would continue to subvert Japan in some ways. A Sinophobic tendency was there. And also, um, the movement of people shows that, um, that again, um, imperial power was kind of fragile in many ways, that, that um, Japanese authorities, Japanese elites were always very anxious about their ability to control their own people and control their own space. So, um, so that's the kind of story I'm telling there about an, an anxious empire um, in relation to China and about space that is not simply um, territorial borders, but space that is in motion. You know, people are flowing, goods are circulating, uh, money is moving, uh, bodies are moving, and um, those flows are in tension with this kind of world of fixed borders. And that was leading into the, the, the question um, about, about borders themselves. You know, I think that most people think about borders the way that we do politically, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, and especially in contemporary terms, Japan is Japan, China is China, 
you know, and there are, of course, border disputes that we see in the news, things like that, but we always think about them as lines mm -hmm. on a map. And that really once one passes from one country into another country, it's a very stark transition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When we're thinking about societies, when it could be much more blurred and part of you, and a lot of which, what you keep returning to in the book, especially are uh, ports, mm -hmm. right? And uh, talking about the, like you said, the, the movement of not only goods, but bodies, humans, that sometimes could be referred to in those terms. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, there's some really fascinating stories. I mean, the way that you go through this book is not, it doesn't read like, uh, a, you know, a normal history. It, it's uh, a series of stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also talk about famous authors. Uh, I think the, the one that you focus probably the most on is uh, Andal. Right. I can not, make a general not, statement. Famous, but that's my point. He wasn't a famous author, but he was widely read. So. And how he was able to talk about this very this maritime kind of region mm -hmm. at this time that was still so very mysterious you know, mm -hmm. between you know Japan and China and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I had the feeling reading this that most people at the time thought of that whole place as I had, I don't know, like a, like a swashbuckling adventure kind of area to mm -hmm. a degree. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this is something that has translated to the current day in terms of people who are interested of that, in that era, that of this mystery and adventure in this space? Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think you're absolutely right that um, that space, the South China Sea, so um, from Taiwan to the South China coast to Vietnam, um, that whole area is constructed as a, as a place of adventure, a place of danger, a place of thrills, right? Um, a place of mystery. And that's what, um, th it's not unique to, to the Japanese imagination of that area. You know, the Japanese were imagining Manchuria in China's Northeast as another kind of place of adventure. They imagined the South Seas as another kind of place of adventure, just as Europeans um, imagine various parts of the world as exotic and dangerous and, and a place to, to pursue thrills and so forth, um, or to be threatened by. So this is, this is something very common um, in human history is these imaginative geographies of, of, um, of exotic and, and, and you know, risky places. Um, what I think, what I'm trying to do is to show how on the one hand, um, in part of the book, what I'm trying to do is to show how on the one hand, there is this construction of this kind of imagined space, um, but how, um, government officials and authors and readers could then think about that space as a place where the Japanese should be, right? That the Japanese had to make their way in this space and that um, this was a place not just to have adventures, but to conquer, right? To establish a Japanese presence. And also then to think about, well, what if we can't conquer it? What are the obstacles to Japanese conquest there? And, um, and the big obstacle is the Chinese. Of course, there are Europeans as well. The Europeans, the French have colonized Vietnam. The Europeans and the Americans are in China. Um, you know, the Philippines are there. The whole region is, is, is full of, of Euro-American imperial interests. Um, but it's also a place that the Chinese historically have a very deep connection to, and there are Chinese immigrant communities, diasporic communities throughout the region, and Chinese merchant capital is very influential in the region, uh, and Chinese uh, labor migration is quite voluminous. And so um, Japanese who entered the South China Sea area um, dreaming of Japan's success, you know, whether it be economic or geopolitical, um, had to confront this Chinese presence that um, they didn't know what to do about. And so some of the writers that I um, address or the, um, the other people that I talk about um, imagine it through gender relations. They imagine stories about um, either Japanese women who, uh, and there is a history of Japanese women who emigrated to um, South China and then to the South China Sea area and beyond as, uh, as sex workers. Um, who were, you know, often poor women who were, um, you know, emigrant, migrating like, like um, global migrants do. They were migrating to improve their lives and to send money back home. 
Um, but people, on the one hand, some people say, well, they're, they're, you know, they're agents of our imperial expansion. They're, you know, you know, they're like warriors. They're going out and they're bringing Japan to um, the periphery. But there are others who, who um, like this author, Ando Sakan, who I write about, who, who were concerned that Japanese women were, you know, their bodies were being subjugated by foreign men, by Europeans, but particularly by Chinese men. Uh, and in, in the thinking of the time, this actually meant physical pollution of the blood, pollution of the body, and, um, and this corruption of Japanese-ness by these foreign elements. Or they wrote about um, Japanese men who struck out to do business, you know, merchants and traders and, and peddlers and so forth throughout the region, and who wound up becoming somewhat, you know, sinified. They became partly Chinese through their marriage with Chinese women or their absorption into Chinese space. And so one of the, the, the themes that I'm looking at is how um, as people move and these lines between Japan and non-Japan get blurred in various ways, some people like take that and, and spin it into these fantasy stories that, you know, are at one level, they're very, um, they're titillating, they're about sex, they're about romance, they're about these kinds of things. And at another level, they're, they're freaky because they're about people becoming hybrids, they're about people losing their identity such as identity is imagined. Um, they're about um, mixed blood children, as they were called at the time. And where do these children belong? Do they belong anywhere? Uh, what happens if we become a mixed blood people? These kinds of fears are on the mind of, of, of um, a good number of Japanese at the time. So again, there's this exotic thrill-seeking um, you know, imagination that is also an imagination of fear, right? What happens to Japan in this world was shaped by China. Now you mentioned ports. That's the other thing I want to talk about is that while well, part of my story, part of my history, um, and history is stories, is about um, these kinds of representations of adventure and, 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 um, and mystery and danger, uh, part of it is actually about human encounters. It's about um, Chinese uh, merchants who come to Japan in the mid to late 19th century after the treaty ports are opened in the late 1850s. Um, and they come to Nagasaki, they come to uh, Yokohama, they come to Kobe, and they establish relationships with local Japanese, and Japan being a very poor country at the time, um, has a surplus of children that um, can't be fed, and um, these children become commoditized. There's a market in children. Now, this was a market in children inside Japan already. Children in Japan were bought and sold all the time. Lots of them were bought and sold all the time under the, the guise of adoption or otherwise. But now you have a, a Chinese market in, in bodies that encounters this Japanese market in bodies. And it means the children are being moved from Japanese space into Chinese space. And that, um, that process becomes a, a diplomatic uh, crisis for Japan or a diplomatic issue for Japan. It becomes um, a political issue for Japan. It becomes a social issue. It becomes a media issue. So that's one of those stories that I'm talking about. How does the Japanese state get its Chinese counterparts to recognize Japanese law about adoption, about the movement of people across borders um, at a time when this Japanese law is just being formed? It's being formed in response to these things, right? And so Japanese space is actually being formed in response to these kinds of market movements. So that's one thing I talk about. The other thing I talk about is these Chinese peddlers um, who come to Japan and uh, wind up cohabiting with either legally marrying or just living with Japanese women and, and forming families with them, um, and then bringing their Japanese wives back to uh, to China, particularly to um, to Fujian Province and to the coast of Fujian Province, a place called Fuching. Um, and the stories that then get told about this are that, you know, these are Japanese men coming to prey on vulnerable Japanese women, abducting them and luring them off to China and enslaving them. Uh, and that becomes a narrative of, as well um, of, you know, these devious Chinese and the Japanese government that has to go and rescue these women in the name of national honor. Um, but when they send in uh, Japanese police agents and others to, to try and find these women, many of the women, um, and I found these archives, um, these um, reports in the foreign ministry archives, many of the women are, are, are dumbfounded that these men have come after them. They say, well, I married this guy. I chose to come to China with him. I remember that part of the book that they, there was like a, a, a were, were they police or they were some kind of government agents and they, they went. Yeah. They, one woman. <laughs> they're stationed, they're police officers who are attached to the consulate in Fujian. Yeah. 
Um, the Japanese foreign ministry, this is an interesting fact that a guy named Eric Esselstrom wrote about a few years ago, that I think two thirds of the Japanese foreign ministry's employees were police officers. And they were stationed at all the consulates and diplomatic outposts all over um, you know, Japan's um, world, particularly in East Asia. Uh, but so, you know, the government in Japan begins to hear these rumors that Japanese women are being bought and sold by Chinese. They contact the consulate in Fuzhou. The consulate sends out these police agents to go and investigate. They, they take these trips, um, often under hazardous conditions in these very remote villages. Sometimes they're allowed in, sometimes they're not. Uh, but they, when they can locate women and interview, they say, we, you know, tell us about your situation. Do you want to leave? You know, we're glad to help you leave. And many of the women are saying, well, no. I, I really don't. Now, um, you know, they say, I have a family here. I've lived here. This is fine. It's not, we're not rich, but it's fine. Um, but, you know, these are the kinds of documents that are very hard to work with. These are the kinds of stories that are very hard to parse out because um, on the one hand, it's very believable that women would say, no, I don't want to leave. On the other hand, who was in the room with them when they said it, right? Whose eyes were they concerned with. It's also possible that a woman could at one moment be very happy in her relationship. Um, she doesn't have to be migrating to China for this in any relationship. One can be very happy at one moment and another moment say, oh my God, what did I get myself into? Um, I need to get out of here. And then a day later be like, no, that, it's okay. I can stay with this, right? Lives are very um, turbulent and unstable things. Um, and so the documents that I have sort of give a sense of this. They give a sense of women sort of um, changing situations over time. Uh, but the, by, by and large, these documents don't support the claims made at the time by the Japanese government or by the sensationalist media that these were abductions. These were international marriages. They were, it was marriage migration. It had its ups and downs. Different cases played out differently, but it was what it was, basically. And to, be, to your credit, I remember what you're talking about in the book, and it came through very clearly that these are human stories. Mm -hmm. And I think there was at least one or two cases that you describe in which there was uh, something like that happened. It was a marriage and a Japanese lady went, you know, um, and I think it, it was a, a, the, the Chinese gentleman, maybe I think was a tailor mm -hmm. or something along those lines. And they went to, I guess it was Fujian and there was some kind of a, a miscommunication or it seemed like a miscommunication about why she was there, if she was really abducted or not. And then she went back to Japan and then ended up going back to Fujian. <laughs> so that really came through about the fact that, you know, I know that you went and you're pouring over these primary sources. Mm -hmm. And even through all of that hardship and research, having the introspection to say, really, what really happened? Mm -hmm. Not only that, that you present the, the, what you read in these documents and you largely leave it up to... The, the the reader you know what really happened here yeah and uh i thought that was really interesting you know thank you i mean that's um you know i'm not the only person who does that by any stretch of the imagination but it's it's when you work with sources like that you have to leave the question marks in place you cannot make definitive assertions about things like this because it's just a very incomplete situation um and so you know but i think what i really wanted to do was show that that um, complexity, right? The openness of interpretation, um, and and to um, at the same time to reveal the operations of this kind of imperialist mentality that says, "Oh, our women are being taken from us; we have to rescue them." Right? This is a, a very patriarchal kind of approach to Japanese women's bodies. Um, just as this author Ando talking about Japanese sex workers was like, "Well, you know." these women are out there and they're representing Japan and somehow they become markers of Japanese fragility in some way, right? So um, it's, it's not unique to the Japanese case at all. Um, you think about, for example, at the same time, roughly in, in, um, in Euro-America, you had these white slavery scares where um, it was reported that young women were being lured away by devious foreigners and then being um, you know, sold off into sexual slavery in, in parts of Asia or the Middle East. Um, you know, nefarious characters of, of all kinds, um, anti-Semitic tropes were part of this as well, anti-Chinese tropes and so forth. Um, and what these all speak to is this notion that, you know, empires, you know, as, as these countries are globalizing in their own way at the time, um, lots of people start moving and states can't control that movement. 
or these movements produce these new kinds of encounters and these new kinds of spaces that um, the people aren't somehow ready for or can't get their heads around and therefore they have to make it seem evil. They have to make these, these um, rumors and stories work to their effect to control it. You know, and you touch, you know, you're talking about it in imperialism, right? And, you know, the Japanese imperialism is quite well documented, you know, this, this, this entire period and, moving, you know, into, uh, you know, the 1900s and the pre-war, pre-World War II. Um, one of the things that I thought was really, really interesting is you talk about in the, in the book, specifically about how, you know, I think Andosan was talking about this. And you, you also talked about, uh, that's my daughter in the background, <laughs> sorry about that. Really? Talk about um, Yamaji Aizan also agreeing that China over time has really been resistant to being conquered, right? That they, they or I guess China is very good at actually, I, I suppose the term would be to sinicize or to bring in other peoples into China and make it part of China and almost in an unintentional, natural, like, you know, gradual way. Mm. I was really interested in how, if there's any connection at all between, first of all, if that's really true, right? If we can really look at it that way. Mm. And if that is somehow connected to how powerful China has become in the modern day. Is that a bit of a stretch or is there any kind of- would say that's a stretch. I mean, China's power, China's power has its own sources. Um, and, um, you know, the China that people like Yamaji Aizan were talking about, the historical China, is not the same as the China of the 20th century. Uh, so we have to be very careful when making these broad generalizations. Sure. Um, but in terms of kind of um, a mythology of China there, I mean, this is what I'm trying to get at more than, you know, what is China, which is, is an impossible question to answer. Just says, what is Japan is an impossible question to answer. Um, you know, rather the question is, um, how have images of China operated in Japan for various reasons? And what you're pointing to with those examples is an image of China as a place where foreign conquerors always wind up losing in the end, right? that the Mongols came in and ultimately, this is the line that these authors are taking, right? In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Mongols came in and ultimately they became more Chinese and less martial, right? Less warrior-like, and that led to their downfall. That the Manchus conquered in the 1640s, but over time they too succumbed to Chinese ways and they became less masculine and they wound up being impoverished and, and so forth, right? That, you know, you can't win with China. The Chinese will always outplay you is kind of the, the line here. They bide their time. They're devious. They creep up on you. And before you know it, you've become Chinese, right? This is the kind of line that these authors are using, right? So it's not, it's not like, we're not talking empirical reality here. We're talking about discourse, right? This is an ideology of what China is. Um, and so then Ando looking at um, Chinese migration to Southeast Asia and South China Sea, um, uh, looking at others, looking at the experience of Japan in the, uh, in the mid to late 19th century when Chinese capital was coming in and actually in some industries, Chinese capital was quite dominant, like the match industry and places like that. Um, looking at this and saying, oh my gosh, you know, the Chinese are going to overtake us. How can we deal with this? Um, and that fear of being overtaken by China, that fear of being conquered by China, that fear of, uh, of China as this devious assimilating force. Um, sort of after 1945, it gets put in abeyance because um, Japan's relations with China, you know, are, are dialed down after 45, right? So uh, first of all, after 49, Japan's relations with China are minimized. Japan has more relations with Taiwan until 1971, 72. Uh, and then the China that Japan re-encounters in the 70s is a China that's coming out of the Cultural Revolution that is looking to Japan for economic assistance, for technological assistance. Japan can be the big brother again to China. This is what the Japanese imperialist dream was uh, previously, being the big brother to China, helping it to modernize. But then in more recent years, as China's migration circuits have expanded, more and more Chinese are coming to Japan. Uh, and as China's power has grown and China geopolitically has been challenging Japan over territory, the islands in the, in the East China Sea and so forth, the fear of China has come back. 
And this notion that um, the Chinese are at it again, the Chinese are out to take over Japan has come back in a very big way. Uh, and ironically, you know, in my epilogue, I talk about this because some of the people who migrated to China with their Chinese husbands in the 1920s and 30s, for example, some of them come back. And in the 1990s, one woman comes back. Um, she had lost her husband who had been beaten to death during the Cultural Revolution, uh, accused of being a Chinese spy. Uh, she left her children in China. She came back. And then in the, in the 2010, around 2010, two of her daughters come back in their 70s. And they take DNA tests to prove that they're Japanese. Um, and they're allowed back in. And then, or they're allowed in for the first time as you know, coming home. But then they bring over 48 of their relatives um, and these 48 relatives come and most of them then apply for public assistance in Osaka and all of a sudden the right wing is saying, oh my gosh, you see, they're not really Japanese, they're just Chinese coming to take advantage of us because we have all this wealth and we're gullible and naive uh, and letting them do it. Um, and so this then, this discourse about, you know, um, China as a place that is devious, China as a place that's predatory, that comes back and it's, you know, you get it over, um, uh, accounts of the Chinese underworld penetrating Japan as well um, in the 1990s and 2000s as well. So these kinds of stories come back. Um, you know, they're a little different in nuance from some of the stories I look at in the pre-war period, but there's a common thread running through them. Um, and it is about, you know, how does Japan fit into this um, regional or global space where China is so powerful and where China is, um, is predatory? No, and that, that's very enlightening because I remember in my time in Japan, I mean, uh, and this was fairly recent, there was an, uh, a bit of an undertone to, you know, rich Chinese people coming in and into Ginza, for example, in Tokyo. And hear little grumblings here and there just from people in general saying, I can't go and get lunch during my lunch break because there are these huge tour groups from mainland China coming in. Mm -hmm. and I guess, I guess from an American background, well, yeah, there's tourists, like it's, yeah, <laughs> and, you know, but I, I understand what you're saying, that it might be this kind of like a, a cyclical thing that, you know, in terms of relations, that th this dynamic between Japan and China is kind of on this rotating thing that, you know, and I, I don't know where it's going to go, but, uh, you know, the stories you talk about in this book are, I mean, and especially like you said in the South China Sea in, in that area, are, are really fascinating. You know, the, this this whole section of culture that I knew very little about, and I feel a little bit more learned that I've I've read this book and about this. You know, the so you talk you, you talked a lot about you know the 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 dynamics there, and you know, uh, talking about this romanticized view. Mm -hmm this area of this space. There's this, and I don't want to ruin it. I want everyone to go out and buy this book because this is a lot of fun. Just, just reading these stories is, is educational and, and fun. There was a lot of piracy going yeah. on in this region. Yeah. I, you know, I, we had talked a little bit about this before I got to this section in the book. But, um, and that was one of Ando's stories, I believe, was the, in the embrace, is there in the embrace of the pirate, the pirate king, yeah. Of the, of the pirate king, of the pirate king. And how much of that, these, and you talk about this a little bit, I mean, a lot of it is really romanticized. Oh, there are these amorous relationships happening between, you know, the, these different, you know, groups and, and then there's betrayals. It really does read like a pulp thriller, right? <laughs> that's a good way to put it. I mean, Ando is writing pulp, basically. Ando's it is. It, it, it's, it's smacked of like, you know, like a Doc Savage or something like that. Like, I like this pulp. Well, Terry and the Pirates, you know, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um, yeah, exactly. Which, which is inspired by the same world, basically. Terry and the Pirates, you know, the dragon lady or whatever she, I mean, this is the world that, um, that we're talking about. There was, um, there was a Norwegian-American journalist, I think, named Aleko Lilias, who wrote a book called I Sailed with Chinese Pirates that was very, you know, a bestseller. Um, you can still find copies of it around. Um, and <laughs> you think for the dragon lady and Terry and the Pirates, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but so piracy, um, and th thanks for bringing that up. That's, it's a big part of the book, actually, in that um, um, Ando Sakan, this, this author who is, you know, he's, he's a, co a colonial drifter, to, just to um, let the um, viewers know who this guy is. He's not somebody that people talk about today. He's not high literature. He's not famous. Um, 
He is uh, a guy who strikes out from Japan uh, in the early 20th century, he's born in 1893, strikes out in the early uh, 20th century, goes to Sagalin Island, which was a Japanese colony at the time, becomes a fisher there for a while, then goes down to Taiwan, becomes a fisher there, then he works in forestry for a while, and then he becomes a newspaper reporter in Taiwan for a Japanese language newspaper. He's a police spy um, for a little bit. And then his newspaper sends him over to the South China Sea to investigate conditions there. And he's just marked by this experience around 1920, 21, writes a book about it. And then all the other stuff he writes is basically recycling this into various fantasies and, and, and uh, opinion pieces. Um, but he is... Um, he kind of starts to make a name for himself as, a, as a, a travel writer. And then in the 1930s, he's picked up by the Daily Yomiuri, which is this major newspaper, uh, who are looking to boost their circulation. And he writes this 75 series install, 75 installment series called In the Embrace of the Pirate King, where he talks about his acquaintance with this Fujianese pirate and his visit to the Fujianese pirates. Um, home village and all the experiences he then has with these pirates as they're, you know, in their town, but also as they go on at sea raiding and all that. Um, and um, so piracy is part of that romanticized vision that he has. And he, he's trying to use the pirates to sort of figure out how he can, you know, make sense of China-Japan relations. And it doesn't work out for him in his story mind. But in terms of um, the other part of piracy that I talk about is that one of the women who, um, moves with her husband from Japan to Fuching, um, she leaves her husband. Her name is Nakamura Soko, Sueko, excuse me. She leaves her husband, um, and we don't know exactly how, but she winds up then married to a pirate, a Chinese pirate um, who's based in, uh, in Fujian and um, is raiding in the Taiwan Strait in the South China Sea. And she becomes like the co-leader of this gang of pirates. And piracy has this very long history in the South China Sea, um, you know, as in other parts of the world. And so I give a little bit of the background of that. But in the 1920s and 30s, it was a big international problem. Uh, and it's an issue between Japan's colony of Taiwan and China. And so she's involved in this. It turns out the pirates that she's involved with are not just bandits, but, you know, they've actually gotten university educations. They, they went to Protestant schools in, in, uh, in Beijing and Nanjing. Uh, they're politically active and they're trying to foment revolution in China and they're, they're robbing boats in order to make money to do this. Um, whether or not she had a political consciousness like that, we don't know, but um, she's part of that world. And so one of the chapters is about her whole life from her parents' migration to Hokkaido and her birth and being raised in Hokkaido to her eloping to China her falling in with pirates, her moving in this world and, and being sort of this conduit between Japanese imperial agents and Chinese pirates uh, in the 1930s and the stories that are told about her. And through that, I, you know, it's about piracy, but it's also about um, how regional space is being transformed. The Chinese government is, is in flux. The Japanese empire is in motion. Piracy is, is working the borders between these two um, geopolitical entities and individuals are maneuvering um, in various ways, and the media is reporting on all of it. Um, so she becomes a regional celebrity, um, and I look at the construction of that celebrity and what it means for Japanese readers in Taiwan or in Japan. Um, and then actually, I, I was able to encounter the nephew of her husband who um, told me the family history from their perspective. And so I was able to work with some other documents and some other angles on this story moving forward. This is another story where, again, there are so many question marks right? This woman, after she's deported back to Japan, she disappears. She gets interviewed a few times and then she's gone from history. We don't know at all what happened to her. Um, but trying to figure out, you know, what we can say about her from the archival records we do have in the foreign ministry archives, from newspaper accounts, from family memories or family folklore um, is a challenge, but I think it's a good way to do history. There's another thing that I'm, I'm sure from your perspective seems very normal because you do so much of this kind of research. Mm -hmm. And I think this is not, I know that this is not uh, just talking about, you know, the peoples in Japan and China and Taiwan. It seems as though at this point in history, and especially the further back we go, um, bilingualism, trilingualism, I mean, it seems a lot more common in this area then, because I remember when I was reading the book, I'm thinking to myself, 
there's all this, you know, back and forth and all that stuff. It must have been pretty normal to just, oh, okay, I'm going to pick up, you know, whatever form of dialect Chinese was in that area at that time. And they, out of, either out of necessity, you know, just do it. And is that really how it was? It was just like, well, you pick up another language. It's, it's, is it more, you know, you know, was it seen a lot more? I, I, I couldn't say that with any confidence. I would think actually that that's not the case. Um, that, you know, the Chinese peddlers and merchants who come to Japan pick up Japanese. Um, they're able to communicate with their customers. They create families, they create social relationships and they, they pick up Japanese. Um, Japanese women who moved with their husbands to Fujian would then have a local interpreter right away. They had someone with whom they could speak Japanese. And because they're in a place, Fuching, where so many of the men are actually going back and forth between Fuching and Japan, there's a lot of Japanese spoken. So I don't know how much the women actually um, had to or got to learn the local dialect. I see. How much women actually communicated with people outside their own villages, we don't know. I mean, sometimes there are some reports of women being able to congregate in other places that were more isolated. Um, but, you know, Nakamura Seiko, I'm sure, would have picked up some, you know, pidgin Chinese, some pidgin, um, you know, Fujianese dialect, but I don't know how much. Um, and, you know, Ando Sakan, someone like that, he might have learned a few phrases that he could throw around, you know, but, you know, I doubt that he spoke Chinese in any way. Now, there are a lot of people uh, at this time who learned to read classical Chinese because that was part of one's education. If you went beyond elementary school, that's right, um, classical Chinese, that's right. Higher school, you learned classical Chinese in one way or another, and so they could read it. And when we think about this thing called the Sinosphere, this Chinese centered space, um, traditionally that's how it's been considered. It's been considered as a place where Chinese culture, Chinese um, written language, Chinese customs, Chinese thought has circulated and been influential in the formation of different societies, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, people like Ando may have had some exposure to that, people he knew and other writers certainly were, you know, they grew up with that and then either they, they continued to, to use that or they moved towards, um, you know, um, a view of contemporary China as somehow of having fallen away from those classical standards, being a more degenerate place that Japan needed to take under its wing. This was a common trope at the time as well. Um, to what extent they spoke actual vernacular Chinese, I, I doubt many spoke much. Um, you know, so I, I, don't think language, I don't think spoken language acquisition was actually from the Japanese side was actually that widespread. I might be wrong, but that's my my hunch about this. Well, just in, in any case, it's very interesting. When I, when I was reading about these interactions, I was like, yeah, you know, I was trying to imagine in my mind, what was this like? Mm -hmm. You know, who was speaking and what were they speaking? Mm -hmm. You know, but it may have just been a very different dynamic where it was, you know, doing the best you could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. I, support, I suppose also with trade and commerce, uh, you know, you just kind of get through it to get to the end <laughs> the, the end right. I mean, you figure out the words you need to know, the sentences you need to be able to say in order to, 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 to you know, achieve your objectives. And um, so, I mean, I'm sure that there was that kind of, you know, everybody had some kind of basic communicative skills, but I don't think there was real, like, extensive language acquisition going on on the Japanese side. Again, you know, I could be wrong about that, but I haven't really seen evidence that that, that was the case. That's fascinating. Well, in any case, I, this is a w wonderful book. I really, really highly, it was a really great read. Thank you. Um, again, I feel much more learned and it's uh, but it's enjoyable. It's enjoyable to hear all, to read about all of these stories and the way you construct it is fantastic. So um, once again, uh, Japan's Imperial Underworld's Intimate Encounters at the Borders of Empire. And where is this book? You know, I think, I believe I got it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. but where else? Can people um, your for your book available wherever books are sold? Um, so that's can, right. Uh, um, you can get it through the big uh, the big chains, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble. You can order it from Cambridge University Press directly. Um, but I would make a pitch for ordering through an independent bookstore because independent bookstores really need the business. Um, I grew up in a place where there were lots of bookstores back in the day, and then um, you know, I moved away for a decade to, um, to Japan and Europe where there were still lots of bookstores, and I came back to the United States, and bookstores were gone. Um, and bookstores have you know, um, made a resurgence 
but they've been really hard hit by COVID-19. So I yeah. mean, if you um, if you want to purchase this book from an independent bookstore, I think it's uh, bookshop.org. I can't remember the um, URL. It might be bookshop.org, um, but there are, there are websites for, that are aggregators for independent bookstores. That's one way to go. Um, and so I would, I would hardly recommend that people purchase it from the independent bookstore. It's in paperback. It's um, I think $32 in paperback, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if you do want an e-version of it, there are e-versions of it as well. So. Well, thank you very much for making time for us uh, to discuss this book. And I'm very much looking forward to your, your next work, uh, wherever your research takes you. 